uh, in the house of God. Uh, I trust you all have had a good week thus far. Uh, last week we looked at the love of Christ as the greatest motivation for the Christian. And uh, this week, you know, I was thinking to myself, uh, what you know, I'm going, what the Lord has uh, for for me to preach this week. And uh, before we start, let's uh, all stand for the reading of God's word. Turn with me to the book of Romans in chapter eight and verse fourteen to verse seventeen. The book of Romans in chapter 8 and verse 14 to verse 17, I will take the first verse, you will take the second, and we will read the last verse together. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, Most High God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, we come to you today, Lord, in thy house. And Father, I ask, Lord, that uh, you even open our hearts and minds to receive your words today, Lord, and put your words in my mouth, that I might even give thy people the words that can come only for thee. Stir the hearts of the people and be here in our midst today, Lord, and bless us all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. about what you know the Lord has for us today and I had two messages in mind and I was going back and forth over which one to preach about so I spent some time praying about it and I still couldn't make up my mind so I messaged Pastor Wee and I said Pastor do you have anything on your mind that perhaps there's a burden for the church that I, that I might preach about and then I took a shut eye at my desk for a while uh, had a short nap I think maybe 20 minutes then I woke up to the sound of uh, the SMS back, the reply from Pastor Wee, and he said, As the Lord leads you, Christian. And that was one of the topics I was thinking about. So I said, without knowing, he has given me the title for this morning's message. And the title for this morning's message is, As the Lord leads you, comma, Christian. All right, there's a comma there. He didn't have the comma, but I add the comma, right? Okay, so... Today, we are going to talk about how the Lord leads us in our life. Last week, we talked about the love of Christ and that being the chiefest motivation for us as Christians uh, in our work with God, in our service to men, and in our uh, keeping to our first love for the Lord. But then the question becomes this, how do I know what God wants me to do? How does the Lord lead me? How does the Lord uh, lead me in my life? Does God have something specific that he wants to accomplish in my life? How can I know? What do I do? In Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, the scripture reads, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now this is a very clear statement. If you are a child of God today, then you will be led by the Spirit of God. Are you a child of God today? Are you born again? If you are, you can expect to be led by the Spirit of God. So the question then again becomes, how? How do I know? What do I do? The Bible says in Psalms chapter 37 and verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. One of the most common questions asked by a genuine believer of Christ, even today, is how can I know that I'm being led of the Lord? This is not a question that uh, is very uncommon. In fact, most of the time, if you go to most churches and you go to most believers, that is one of the bugging questions. How can I know his individual will for my life? How does the Spirit lead? Does God have a specific will for my life? And is it possible to know his specific will? Now, what do I mean by specific will? It means, does God have for Christian me a specific thing that he wants me to do? 
Because of the myriad of different opinions given by so many different speakers, there is, there is a lot of confusion on this topic. Now you have some people who claim direct revelation from God through dreams, visions, and voices. You have the charismatics who say, you know, last night I heard, I saw a dream, God spoke to me, he says, you know, go and do this or go and do that. And then you have those that believe that God leads to the feeling, which means if I feel good about it, it means God is leading me. They believe that circumstances and feelings are the way in which God leads them. Then you have those that use the Bible as some kind of a fortune cookie. So what they do, and this is not as uncommon as you might think, huh? they will just flip open the Bible and the first verse they hit, oh, that must be for me today. And if it doesn't apply to them, they will spiritualize it some way so it applies to them. So basically, you know, they're going through a, a tough time in their life. They open up, Jesus wept. Oh, <laughs> yeah. God must be very unhappy at my situation. But you know, it, it sounds funny, but the fact is I have heard and I have seen so many people tell me sometimes, as, in, a, in a way they're proud of it. They're like, you know, this morning I opened my Bible and the first verse I see, I'm not saying uh, that God can't impact you with the first verse you see, but to take it as a science is problematic. And then there are those that claim that God does not have a specific will for your life per se. They say that God has a corporate general will for everyone, but he doesn't have a specific exact will for you. And oftentimes, because of this confusion, you find Christians sort of making their own minds up on this issue. So you go and ask everybody in this room, and everyone would have some idea roughly about what, how they think the Spirit leads them. And normally it's a hybrid. They take these four opinions and kind of mix it together and they got this foggy idea that this is how God leads them. And uh, it's very often times this is an issue of much confusion. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians in chapter 14 and verse 33, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, there is a story said by a, a missionary about this uh, Native Americans in America. Now, every February, the Native Americans from various tribes would basically head to Mirando City, Texas, to the Native American church there, and they would smoke something called peyote. It's some sort of a, a, a herb that can induce a high uh, where they can get hallucinations and visions and so on and so forth. And uh, there are about 300,000 members of this church. And this drug that is actually banned in the US is made from the caps of spineless cactus. And what they would do is in February every year, they would go down there and they would basically spend from Saturday evening to Sunday afternoon singing songs, sharing testimony, sounds very church-like, huh? and also smoking this uh, herb called peyote. And when people ask them, how can you do this kind of drugs and call it something of God? Their reply is that this drug allows them to enter the divine presence and to capture the spirit of God and to know the leading of the spirit of God. I mean, that's a strong, those are very strong statements to say that by smoking this uh, or consuming this herb, I'm actually having, I'm getting into the presence of God and I'm, 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 I'm getting his leading. So even even these people who are not believers in Christ, who are unbelievers, still want to know what God has for them. Unfortunately, this sort of talk uh, is not quite as uncommon even in Christianity today, as much as we would like to think. I mean, for those of you who have been in charismatic churches or come out from charismatic background, sometimes when you ask a person, what is God's will for you, the kind of responses you get might throw you off. And uh, some people believe that the leading of God, the leading of spirit, is a mystery. The question is this, what does the Bible say about the leading of the spirit of God? How can we know for sure? So again, we are dividing this into three portions today. The first portion is the manner in which the Holy Spirit speaks to us. The manner in which the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Turn with me to the book of John in chapter 16 and verse 13. 
John chapter 16 and verse 13. John 16, 13, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit is known as the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth. So what we know for sure is this, that whatever the Holy Spirit is going to say to us is going to be 100% absolute truth. Now the question then becomes, how can we know if it's absolute truth? The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, we go back to our principal text. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, I've heard so many preachers talk about this verse, and Christians too, that the Holy Spirit kind of here gives us a, almost like a, a, a feeling or a kind of, a, um, how can I put this, perhaps some sort of uh, uh, instinct that we are the children of God. But the Bible says very clearly, the Spirit itself beareth witness, beareth witness. And nothing can be further from the truth. The witness of the Spirit is the witness of the truth. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, number one, He will speak Scripture. Period. He will speak scripture. Turn with me to the book of Hebrew, Hebrews in chapter 3 and verse 7 to verse 11. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7 onwards. Now this is a, an example from the scriptures to know how the Holy Spirit speaks. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest." Now turn with me to Psalms chapter 95 and verse 7 to verse 11. Psalms chapter 95 and verse 7 to verse 11 again. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. The Holy Spirit in Hebrews chapter 3 is quoting Psalm 95 almost verbatim. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he speaks scripture. Turn again with me to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 15 to verse 17. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 15 to verse 17. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And now turn to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33 and 34. I know it's a bit of flipping, but I just want you to see the similarities here. Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse 33 and 34. But 
but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days saith the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them saith the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The Holy Spirit will never, ever, ever tell you something that is contrary to God's word. Today, you will go to a Christian bookstore and you will find tons of books by people who claim to be apostles, by people who claim to be prophets, by people who claim to be pastors, by people who claim to be all sorts of things. And sometimes when they can't find anything to back up what they are saying, they go to the good old, oh, I was led by the Spirit, or the Spirit said to me. And I don't know about you, sometimes you go to YouTube, and you can find instances where you have these prophets who conduct these shows and they say, oh, God told me that this person has this disease and that person had that disease and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, that the Holy Spirit cannot work in any of these wondrous ways as in appearing in, in, in dreams and visions and all that. And in some parts of the world where the gospel is not preached or where there is no uh, uh, presence, you have heard of people in, in villages who have perhaps seen a dream or vision and the dream and vision they have seen almost exactly quote scripture and I'm not here to say that that cannot happen at all but what I'm trying to say is the regular way in which the spirit of God works is that the spirit speaks to us through the word that he has already uh, given us now there are some people who would go to a church that follows, that doesn't follow the scripture, that, you know, perhaps, uh, uh, goes against the, the tenets of the Bible, and, uh, they see the, the, the principles that scripture has given us, and they see that the church they're in does not match, perhaps in the way they worship, perhaps in the Bible they use, perhaps in the, the way the church conducts itself, perhaps it may, perhaps the church isn't even a church, and they, and you show them from the Bible why they should not be in such a church. And they will say, you know, I see what you're saying, but if God really doesn't want, to be, want me to be here, he can tell me. He will tell me. But the Bible already has told you. The Bible has told you time and time again of these things. Come out from among them and be separate. The Bible has given us warning after warning about the, the, uh, the trouble with compromise, the trouble with uh, uh, diluting the word of God. And yet there are people who expect expects God to, to, to speak to them in a way that is apart from uh, the scriptures. And at the end of the day, the, the question is this, how do I know for sure if the spirit that is talking to me is indeed the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Right? Because there are a lot of spirits these days in the world. We know that in this world, the God of this world is present and he, he has his own spirits with him. And uh, it is not very far-fetched to say that his own spirits can appear as angels of light. And the devil himself can appear as an angel of light. So if we don't have a yardstick on which to measure, you know, how the, whether, what the, whether the words that is coming from this Holy Spirit are indeed the words of truth, then we are in trouble. Turn with me to the book of 2 Peter in chapter 1 and verse 19 to verse 21. Now, Peter was one of the uh, disciples that was privy to the scene of transfiguration when Jesus was seen 
with two of the Old Testament prophets. And it was a glorious sight. It was a sight that if any one of us saw, we'd probably be just be, you know, uh, that would be a, a something that when we see it, we would keep it in our hearts and it'll be a, a, an experience that we will never forget. But Peter here says in chapter 1 and verse 19 of Second Peter, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, like I said earlier, you will have all sorts of people claiming that they had this experience or that experience, and they are very quick to claim that the Holy Spirit spoke to them, something that the Holy Spirit didn't speak to you about. And uh, when I was in my teens, I was very curious about a lot of things, so I went to a charismatic, messianic congregation just to see what it's about. So this group of people, what they would do is that they would follow a bit of the Old Testament and keep the Sabbath and so on, but they were charismatic. And so I went, it was, they were congregating in this house, so I went, I was first time guest there. And uh, initially it started out well, they were talking, they were reading the scriptures, and then suddenly someone started, you know, he, they stood up and they started singing and they started, uh, you know, speaking in so-called tongues, but, you know, gibberish in that sense. And they were just dancing around and uh, even women who were leading the congregation dancing around and sort of uh, speaking in gibberish and saying, oh, they hear from the Spirit and so on. And they were circling around me and eventually one of them got up and said, the Spirit just spoke to me, your name is now Caleb. <laughs> And I said, Caleb, man, I mean, if you want to give me a Christian name, it, it can't get more Christian than my name. I already got Christian, all right? <laughs> so the Spirit is trying to give me a more uh, a biblical name, a Christian. I don't know, I don't know what to say, but you know, I didn't, I didn't want to offend them at that time. I was a first time guest. It was someone's house. So I, I kept my silence, but I think I couldn't control my laugh. And uh, that, was, and then I went home. I think I told my folks about it. And I, I was I, for a, for one week. I was just having a, a ball of a time, uh, thinking, man, you know, they actually had the uh, the 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 daring, you know, the the they were act, they actually dared to say the Holy Spirit said this to me. And I mean, if I'm going to attribute something to the Holy Spirit, I better be very, very sure that the Holy Spirit is, is saying these things. It is not a light matter to add to the Word of God. It is not a light matter to subtract from the Word of God. It is a serious, serious thing. We see it in the book of Revelations. We see it in Deuteronomy. God does not take lightly to people adding to and subtracting from His Word. If you want to go to someone and you want to encourage the person, you want to tell them what God has to say, then go back to the scriptures because it is from the scriptures that the Holy Spirit leads his people. I mean, don't fall for Holy Spirit secrets, all right? If it's such a secret, then you don't have to know. Okay, if the Holy Spirit is giving secrets, different secrets to different people, and they all come and tell you, oh, only I heard it, then it's not important for you to know. All right, everything that is important for you to know is already in Scripture. Now, have you ever tried to evangelize to a friend? And uh, perhaps, you know, you haven't been reading the Bible that often and you haven't been reading the scripture very often. And then you're, suddenly you meet this friend and this friend starts talking to you about God. And all of a sudden, you have this urge to share with him the gospel, for those of you who are believers here. And perhaps you haven't read the Bible in so long, but as you are speaking with them, a verse just comes to mind. And you share that verse, and you know for a fact that on a regular day, you would never have thought of that verse. I don't know how many of you have, have uh, experienced this, or perhaps when you are facing a, a point in life when you're about to do something, and suddenly a verse comes to mind. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Things when you, are, when you have to make a vital decision, and this verse that you never thought of five minutes ago suddenly comes to your mind, and it applies to the situation you're in. Now, some people say it's coincidence, but if you're a child of God, and if the word of God comes to mind, then the Holy Spirit is speaking to you through his word. 
But of course, at the same time, you have to be careful, right, that we take the word of God in its context as well and uh, uh, not abuse it, right? So it could, be a, it could be a verse that you have memorized. Sometimes it could just be a verse that you read. But somehow when you are sharing the gospel, when you are at a time in your life when you need guidance, that verse comes back to you and it's a verse that's in the Bible, go back to the Bible and check because maybe God is trying to tell you something from his word. You know, we have God's word right in our homes, right with us. I think some of us here probably have more than what? How many Bibles do we have at home? And we're asking, oh, where can I hear the Lord speak to me? You know, we want to hear secrets other than what is in this book. And that is the first flaw. First of all, God leads you by talking to you through his word, number one. Now, you ask me, yeah, I know that. But what about the specific will? I want to know whether I should go to this uni or this uni. I want to go whether I should marry this girl or this girl. I want to know whether I should, you know, uh, 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 work in this office or that office. What about that? We'll come to that. But first we need to go on a journey. The first part we need to establish is God's word. The second part is the direction in which the Holy Spirit leads. The direction in which the Holy Spirit leads. Now, most of us today, I mean all of us, like in fact, have GPS when we are driving, yeah? So we use Google Maps, we use Waze, we use all these things to navigate. And I remember when I was young, and we would go on family vacations to Malacca and all that, we would be using uh, the traditional map. And sometimes the shopping center is just there, and we get there after one hour. <laughs> You know, because you are driving all around the town and finally you're like, man, it was just beside the hotel. What are we doing? You know, but now you have GPS, you have ways, you have Google Maps. I can go to a place I completely don't know about and get to my destination very quickly. So with GPS, we are able to navigate very quickly. Now let's imagine for a while that we are using a map and we are on a holiday. And the hotel staff, let's say you go to the hotel, you tell the staff, I want to go to the zoo. And the hotel staff takes the map and she marks out on the top, zoo. And then at the bottom side, you see library, cafe, and maybe uh, hotel. So you know that the library and the zoo are two different places. So what you do, you drive. But as you're driving, your child suddenly sees a library. Say, hey, mom, dad, there's a library there. Immediately you know, eh? But I saw the library was on the bottom side. The zoo was on top. I'm going in the wrong direction. So what you do, you immediately change course if you want to get to the zoo. But normally in the Christian life, we see that Christians don't apply the same concept in their own lives. This is often what happens in the Christian life. We spend so much time going the other way before we realize that we are being led, uh, we are not being led by the map. If you turn to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 to verse 26, Galatians 5, 16 to 26. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 26. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strifes, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such 
There is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, oftentimes we want to be led of the spirit of God. We say, God, lead me. And God gives us a map and he marks up the spot. Now, let me, let me just... Uh, before I walk you through this, let me just say this. The spirit and the flesh are contrary one another. If you go to verse 17 of chapter 5, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Just as your flesh lusts against your spirit, the things that you want to do, you cannot do because of your, your flesh is weak. Your spirit also lusts against the flesh. That is why sometimes we get tired. That is why Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, when you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It is not you may not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It is not you probably won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It is you will not. Which means you cannot be fulfilling the lust of the flesh and walking in the spirit at the same time. Neither can you be walking in the spirit and fulfilling the lust of the flesh. They both cannot be together. They are completely, that means there's no such thing as half spirit, half flesh. There is no such thing. Either at any point of time, you are either being led of the spirit or you are being led of the flesh. They are contrary to one another. It is like looking at a compass. All right, on the north, you put spirit. South, you put flesh. They are two opposite sides. And either you are going north or you are going south. You can't be going both directions. Now, let's take a journey. Uh, imagine for a while. Sometimes we, when we think of God leading us, you know, we, we, we have very uh, standard phrases we use and all that. But just imagine for a short while. Remember I was talking to you about a map and I said how you put the zoo on top and you have the library below. Now, let's use Galatians chapter 6. Or was it 6? Galatians chapter 5 as our map. Let's say we went to the hotel and we gave them Galatians chapter 5. Now, they are marking this out for us on the map. Let's say you are in the middle, okay? Let me brief you on what is on the southern landmark. As you go south about two kilometers, you will find a cafe called adultery, fornication, and uncleanness. You go south another four kilometers, and there's a petrol station called lasciviousness, idolatry, and witchcraft. You go further south one kilometer and you will find the hatred, variance, emulations, wrath and strife hotel. Breakfast not provided. If you go further south three kilometers, you will come to a dead end where you will find the envying, murders, drunkenness and revelings nightclub. Now on top, the north, you find a five-star resort called Love, Joy, Peace, Two kilometers up, long suffering, gentle goodness, health and wellness spa, free package. And three kilometers north, you will find the faith, meekness, and temperance beach. Now, it's very clear one's at the north and one's at the south. Now, let's say you're looking for God's will in your life. Should I go to this place to work or that place to work? Now, I'm striving. I'm envious of my friend who got the job there. I'm constantly thinking about whether he earns more than me, I earn less. I'm constantly angry, I'm constantly uh, striving for a, a job in this place. Then you're obviously going south down that road to strive, variance, emulations, and so on. But if you're looking for this place, you're, you're deciding between two places, and you feel joy, you feel peace, you are totally resigned to the will of God. You know that this place that you work for, you know, is going to give you time to go for your Bible study, it's going to give you time to study God's Word, it's going to give you time to be with the people of God and do the things of God, and you have no strife, then you know you are being led in the right direction. So this is a very basic level of going in the right direction towards being led by the Spirit of God. You want to know if you are following the map of the Spirit? Check the landmarks. Are you envious? Are you striving? 
These are obvious signs that you're not being led by the Spirit of God. It's very easy to say, oh, I want to know, you know, I want to know how the Spirit leads me. But at the same time, at every turn, you don't display the, 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 the fruit of the Spirit, but you display everything that is contrary to the Spirit. The Bible is clear. The flesh, contrary to the Spirit. The Spirit, contrary to the flesh. They cannot mix. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 20 I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment. The leading of the Spirit of God will lead you through the path of holiness. The leading of the Spirit of God will lead you through the path of holiness. As the Spirit leads you, the Spirit will overwhelm you. And you know, we oftentimes hear the saying, the, the, the ends justify the means. But in the Christian walk, in the, walk in, the, in the daily walk of the Christian life, the means is an indicator of the end. Because if you are going down the path of strife, your end will be that of strife. If you are going down the path of wrath, your end will be the path of wrath. If you are following the root of the flesh, your end will be the root of the flesh. Now you tell me, but there are some people, uh, they do all these things, but they are rich, they are successful, they have everything. But that's what you see. You see one angle and you see that this person has it all. But there is another angle where he is just internally in turmoil. He is in strife. He has completely no peace in his heart and no joy. And even if he does, the Bible says these people are on slippery ground. And when they fall, they're finished. All right? The means is just as important as the end. Before you can come to identifying the specific will of God in your personal life, you must check to see that you are going in the right direction. Some of us are talking about what the Lord wants for us to, uh, uh, like, for example, we want to have, uh, uh, we want to work in this office, so on and so forth. We want to do this, or we want to perhaps choose a, a certain type of job. Maybe you've just finished school. You are thinking, should I go to, should I, or maybe you are in school and you are thinking, should I take this course or should I take that course? Perhaps you should wonder, which direction am I now going in? Am I going in the direction of the Spirit? Or the direction of the flesh. So now we talked about how the Spirit talks to us, how the Spirit leads us. What I'm trying to do today is to make this a bit more real for us. Oftentimes you read these passages of scriptures and I am not going to, I mean I'm sure most of us here have read Galatians 5, the verses that we have read time and time and time and time again. But the question is this, how can I use it as an indicator of what God wants me to do? I know, fruit of the spirit, fruit of the flesh, and so on and so forth. But how can I use it as a gauge? How can I use it as a gauge? Next, now we will go on to the specific will. The specific will of the Holy Spirit. I'm not a slights person, okay, but I thought this was a good way to make a point. So we have God's word here, and then we have God's way and his general will for us, the way of holiness, and then we have the bull's eye of God's specific individual will for our lives. A lot of times, we are somewhere around here, and we are wondering, where can I find God's will? We are somewhere here, and we are saying, hey, let's go and ask pastor what God wants us to do with our lives. When God's will is in the center of God's word and God's way. So you have to go past these two circles in order to get to the specific will of God for your life. The specific will of God for your life. There are a growing number of people, as I said earlier, who claim that God does not have a specific will for individuals anymore. They say that it is impossible to know exactly what God intends for your life. Now, what they mean uh, is basically this. Let me give you an example. Let's say John wants to decide on a life partner. And he has two options, maybe Mary and Sarah, okay? 
And according to God's word, these two women are godly women. They are believers. They love the Lord. They, you know, uh, they want to devote their life to God. According to the Bible, pass. At the same time, he feels that these, both these women will lead him towards holiness. They are not worldly. They do not, uh, uh, you know, they do not mind the things of the world. So who does he marry? Does he marry Mary? Or does he marry Sarah? Now, some of these people say, you can't know for sure. They say, once you marry, then you'll know. <laughs> they say, once you marry, then on retrospect, you can say, oh, yeah, yeah, that was God's will for me. But I believe, and I am persuaded, that that is a completely faithless and humanistic way to see this issue. The Bible is replete and full of examples of God's working His specific will in the lives of believers. And it is also filled with loads of examples of His people seeking His will before making a decision. God has a tailor-made plan for each and every single one of us here today. A tailor-made plan for each and every one. And I believe that we, it is important that we be convinced and convicted of this matter. Because if we are not, then we just go about aimlessly. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah in chapter 30 and verse 21. Isaiah in chapter 30 and verse 21, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left, we can know the specific will of God in our lives. Now we are going to see some proofs from the Old and New Testaments to see how this is the case. The Old Testament uses about 16 different words to describe will in referring to both God and man. And one of the words it uses very commonly is the word ratson. And if you go to a Jewish uh, a prayer book or you go to a synagogue, you will hear this word repeated over and over again as the Jews seek after God's will. And you'll hear ratson, ratson. Sometimes you might not hear any other word but ratson, right? And it's a very common word uh, that is used in a Hebrew prayer. If you turn with me to the book of Psalms in chapter 143 and verse 10, Psalms 143 and verse 10. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. In this passage, David is crying out to God, Lord, teach me to do thy will. Now, if you look at the, the whole passage, if you go to Psalms 143, Give me one second. All right. And if you look at verse 6, there is a word, Selah, at the end of verse 6. I stretch forth my hands unto thee, my soul thirsted after thee as a thirsty land, Selah. And then there's a second portion there from verse 7 to verse 12. So in the first six verses, David you know, talks about how he's facing great opposition from his enemies. He's seeking God's help and telling God how he's searching for him and thirsting for him. The second portion shows David's desire to know what God wants him to do in this matter. It is a very, it is very specific in verse 8. If you go to 1, 4, 3 and verse 8, cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for indeed do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. In verse 10, teach me to do thy will. This is a very specific request for a very, very specific sort of will. You see, David was not any old man. David was a man after God's own heart. Of course, he was a sinner, 
But at the same time, he meditated on God's word. And uh, he was one of the few kings that left God's word and God's law. And uh, we see that even, he, even though he was very rooted in God's word, he still cried out to God to know God's specific will. We, when we were in the church camp, we saw the kings of the Bible, and we saw time and time again how before battle, a godly king would say, let us inquire of the Lord. Let us seek his face. You know, they go to God, they ask God, what should I do? Should I fight or should I not fight? Should I stay or should I not stay? And the book of Psalms is filled with numerous other prayers and not general guidance, but specific knowable guidance and you will have example after example of godly kings going after the specific will of God in matters relating to war and prophecy. Now in the New Testament, turn with me, turn with me to the book of Acts in chapter 16 and verse 6 to verse 10. Acts chapter 16, verse 6 to 10. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over in Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, a shortly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now, the Apostle Paul desired to preach the gospel in Asia and Bithynia, but God wanted him to go to Macedonia. It would not have violated God's general plan or God's word for Paul to have gone to Asia, right? Because the Bible says going into all the world and preach the gospel. So if Paul had gone into Asia, you know, uh, practically speaking, he would not have violated God's word in that sense or God's general way. But we see that the Holy Spirit had other plans for him and had a specific plan for the Apostle Paul. So now we know that God has a specific tailor-made will for each of us. The question is, how can we know? What if I'm looking for a job and both the job seems fine in light of scripture? What if I'm looking for a spouse and both the uh, spouses look fine? What if I'm looking uh, for whether or not I should be in ministry? Or perhaps I'm looking for guidance on just making a decision regarding how to approach someone with the gospel we will look at some of the ways number one is the test of a lasting godly desire turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13 Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13 before I go any further I just want to dis add a disclaimer here I'm not going to put the Holy Spirit in a box or say that, oh, this is the way, this is the only way. This is the general way in which the Holy Spirit uh, will lead a believer that fears Him. But sometimes we can be naughty children and the way a father deals with a naughty child is very different from the way he deals with an obedient child. And sometimes he might lead you with chastisement. Sometimes he might lead you with smacking you to the right way. There are many different ways. But here I'm talking about if you truly in your heart want to know how God wants to lead you and you are willing to obey the Lord, a strong indicator in determining God's will. Uh, first for it is God, if you go to Philippians 2.13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. A strong indicator in determining God's will after you have passed the first two tests is this do you have a lasting pressing desire a lasting pressing desire i'm not talking about something like oh today there's a revival sermon and then a preacher preaches and then you say amen i'm going to go to africa next week and be a missionary and tomorrow morning you wake up you're like everything's forgotten i'm talking about a desire that takes root in your heart and that is there 
throughout a long of a certain period of time it's constantly bugging you and you know that it cannot be of the flesh because the flesh is contrary to the what to the spirit and the spirit is contrary to the flesh and if it is a desire to what the things of the spirit and the word of the lord says that this is correct in the word of god and the direction of the lord uh, uh, enables you to understand that this will, will, will bring you towards the path of holiness and according to the, the fruit of the Spirit, then, and it's something that you have in your heart for a long period of time, it is likely that you are being led by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, maybe you're spending time uh, reading God's Word and desiring to be holy, and God puts it in you, hey, you know, actually, I, I can go and serve Sunday school, I can teach the children. I always like children and I'm good with children. And there's this desire that is put in you and after four months or five months or six months or a year, every time you think of serving the Lord, you think of serving the children's Sunday school. Perhaps that is God's way of putting this burden in your heart for you to serve Him in this way. Now, first of all, it's not of the flesh. Second of all, it's according to God's word. It's according to the way of God and it's a lasting and it's a desire that is uh, continual. It's a continual leading desire. And uh, it's not a sort of a, what do you call it, flesh in the pan or today come tomorrow go sort of thing. Second, the test of prayer. The test of prayer. Proverbs 3 and verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Now, we often quote this verse, trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean on to thy own understanding. But when we talk about acknowledging God, what does that mean? It means that we put it to Him and commit what we are doing to Him in a way that we know that the thing that is going to come forth is going to be God's way of leading us. We acknowledge that, Lord, I'm committing this to you, and this is going to be you dealing with it. I, I can tell you for a fact that of all the things that I, all the things that have turned out right personally for me have turned out right because of simple prayers and all the things that have turned out wrong has been simply because I didn't commit it and just say, Lord, do it for me. And sometimes it's just a simple thing. It's not like you sit down and you do a, a whole, it's just, Lord, I'm going to do this. I leave it to you. Huh? Do it for me or lead me in what I should do. Just a simple thing where you acknowledge the Lord. What does acknowledge mean? Acknowledge means I acknowledge, I, I give a nod to, I, I agree with the fact that God is in control. And uh, one of the best ways to know is God's, uh, God's will is to acknowledge Him. When the psalmist of old asks for God's will, they make, he, make, he makes it known to them. And He's able to use both open and closed doors. You apply to two universities, both are good. One rejects you, one accepts you. Great. You pray to the Lord, you say, Lord, show me which one. Sometimes he closes all the doors and leaves one open. You go through that door. Right? He's able to both open and close doors. 2 Corinthians 2.12, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Sometimes God opens and closes doors. And lastly, the test of peace. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also we are called in one body, and be ye thankful. When you walk according to God's word in the way of the Spirit, the Lord will guide you with peace of mind. Now what do I mean by peace of mind? I don't mean a feeling. You know, the, the word feeling appears in the Bible about 14 times. Feelings, felt, uh, feels, and all that. About 14 times. And not one time does it refer to how the Holy Spirit talks to you. What I'm talking about, the peace of the Spirit, is when you acknowledge something to God, and you say, God, this is something that I'm committing to you, I'm asking you to be in charge of this, you have that peace that God will take care of it. You have that peace that God is going to carry you through, and God will open the right doors and shut the wrong ones. It is an inner peace that passeth all understanding. It is not a fleeting sort of, today I feel like uh, doing this, tomorrow I feel like doing that sort of feeling. It is an inner peace. And lastly, I just want to close with this. There is a man that heard a voice from heaven. And the man heard the voice saying, go and preach in the west of Singapore. 
So he prays to God, God, where do you want me to go? Do you want me to preach in Bukit Batok? Or do you want me to preach in Jurong East? Or do you want me to preach in Dover Road? Where? And he's not getting a reply. And he says, God, I'm asking you for your will. Where do you want me to preach? But while he's asking, he's actually in Germany taking a train to Switzerland. He's not even in Singapore. You know, oftentimes we ask God, we say, God, I want to know your will, but we don't want to know his word. We don't want to know his way. And we say that we want to know God's specific will in our life, but we are somewhere here. We are somewhere here. We are not anywhere in this circle. So today I want to close with this. Do you really want to know God's will? Or is it just good Christian talk? Is it just a good way of saying, let's hope now, you know? The Bible says, for all, all things work together for good to them that love God, and to them that are called according to His purpose, Romans 8, 28. Now, first of all, if you're not even a believer today, if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're not saved, and you cannot be led of God. Because God, the Spirit of God, leads the children of God. So today, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, know this, number one, all of us are sinners. There is no way we can make it to heaven on our own. Number two, while we are sinners, Christ died for us. And Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And today, if you want to know how you can be saved and how you can have a loving relationship with God and know God's plan and God's will for your life and know your eternal destiny, Please uh, talk to one of us and we would love to share with you the gospel. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, Lord, Most High God, God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have a specific will for each of our lives. We thank you that we are so precious to you, Lord, that you will that we, we all work together, Lord, for your glory and that you even have something even for us who are sinners and who are just Nothing, Lord, but you have made us your children. We ask that you will allow us to walk in your ways and according to your words, that we might also know your will. We commit all this into your hands, Lord, and we ask that you guide each of us as we make decisions about the rest of the year in our lives. In Jesus' most precious name, amen.